few notices for the applied subscribers before we begin <clears throat> and uh, one notice for everybody uh, when I do begin the market outlook in a few minutes you'll notice that uh, my voice sounds a little bit hollow that's because I unplugged my microphone to hook up the USB cable to recharge my mouse and when I unplugged my mouse I did not replug in the external speaker so it is the uh, computer's internal microphone that is picking up my voice and it sounds uh, a little bit hollow and tingy uh, as opposed to using the external microphone which is a much better sound uh, for the applied series subscribers on Monday <clears throat> last Monday I uploaded part 5 of understanding banks that is capital adequacy uh, and all of the regulatory uh, uh, ratios that need to be met and understanding those on Friday um, week 5 of the portfolio uh, management construction uh, series introducing short straddles into the um, theta portfolio I was going to do an allocation factory uh, but with some rebalancing and the market being weak it made sense at that point to introduce uh, a delta neutral strategy for the theta portfolio which is a more common way to run a theta portfolio is you want to try to be as delta neutral as possible it just made sense to introduce the short straddle at that point next week I'll do the allocation factory unless something shows up uh, some things that I have on my list of things that I want to get done require a certain market condition under which to do them and if you don't have that market condition it makes no sense to attempt to do it because well you're not doing anything because the condition under which you would do it doesn't exist so if next week the market presents an opportunity to present something else I will failing that it'll be uh, an allocation factory um, <clears throat> throughout the week I also have been working on a bottom-up for Freeport and uh, I'm uh, about a third of the way through the narration uh, it is a lot of laying out of your screens and uh, getting all your exhibits ready and then you narrate I'm about a third of the way through, uh, an hour and ten in, so it's going to be about three and a half, four hours uh, long. Uh, and uh, I've got, uh, like I say, about an hour of it narrated already. There are some screens that we go through that help you explain certain things, but for the most part, we're sticking with uh, the 10K. Then we'll move to the most recent 10Q and then some presentations. Uh, so hopefully that'll be up this week. I do have three hours a day <clears throat> of uh, live uh, sessions for CFA level three mock exams uh, from now right up until the exam. Uh, so I am, uh, you know, my time is kind of spread a little bit thin for the next two weeks, but I will try to get this done and up for this week. There was some positive feedback last week when I started with the economic data before we went into rates it gave a little bit more meaning to why the rates moved the way they did so let's do the same thing uh, let's start with China there was some interesting uh, information out of China last week uh, foreign exchange reserves 3.2 trillion 3.204 trillion uh, the previous was 3.193 trillion their foreign reserves continue to decline the two bigger stories out of china last week was the balance of trade uh, and inflation let's have a look at their balance of trade it came in uh, lower than expected the forecast for exports was a drop of 12 and a half percent and it came in at a drop of 14 and a half percent expressed in u.s dollars Imports uh, was for a forecast of a 5% drop. It dropped 12.4%. So we're going to look at it uh, two ways. Let's look at it, first of all, U.S. dollars monthly level, not seasonally adjusted. And you see this drop, uh, this big, these um, spikes down. That's February uh, to match the Chinese New Year. Uh, so there's February there, and there's the bounce back up in March. And then you've had a decline uh, since with a small little from uh, May to, to June, a small little uh, increase in the level of exports. But again, this is not seasonally adjusted. And because you have this kind of pattern, there is seasonality. You want to look at it seasonally adjusted. So that is our first series here. And we will zoom right into that. There is uh, the trend 
you had the bounce back in March after uh, February and then each month after that has been declining although you are still above pre-pandemic levels let's just zoom back out here look at this uh, stability over this period of time from roughly about 2010 to uh, 2020 there's your pandemic drop off and there is the uh, boom in the goods sector because the economy was shut down everybody had money and if you give people money they will spend money they will buy whatever they can uh, and they moved into goods uh, so that was a significant increase in exports uh, coming out of China well now we're shifting back out of goods into services we can see it in uh, inflation numbers CPI when we look at goods inflation versus services inflation that has really come down uh, and in uh, quite a few categories in the CPI it's actually in deflation uh, and we're going to learn shortly that uh, China's CPI is in deflation as well but this is the concerning thing that it seems to be dropping uh, dropping off uh, more than expectations the uh, CPI number inflation that came out of China the forecast was for negative 0.4 uh, on the inflation rate year over year. Previous read was zero. This was for negative 0.4. It was actually negative 0.3. Yes, negative, but not the negative 0.4. It was negative 0.3. Uh, month over month, the forecast was for negative 0.1. Uh, and it came in at 0.2. So year over year uh, is in deflation, but the inflation rate month over month was 0.2. The previous was negative 0.2. The forecast was negative 0.1. It came in at 0.2, but it was the year-over-year -year headline that got all the news. China's entered deflation, uh, negative 0.3, on a year-over-year -year basis, but uh, faster-moving data says no. It's actually gone from negative 0.2 the previous month to positive 0.2 in this month. And PPI, year-over-year, negative 4.4%. Previous was negative 5.4. This is negative 4.4. So, yeah, if you're going to look at the year over year headline, you can make a headline China enters deflation. But if you look at the month over month and you annualize it, no, they are not in deflation for the month of July. It came in at 0 0.2, which, uh, which was positive. So, that sort of set uh, a bit of a negative tone in terms of uh, U.S. equities, which helps explain why uh, after the CPI report, uh, the market celebrated, but then uh, sort of gave it up later in the day because these concerns are weighing. Uh, on Friday, uh, we had more news out of China, new loans. Uh, the forecast was for 800 billion yuan, uh, and it came in at 345.9 billion, less than half. Um, money supply increased 10.7%. The forecast was for 11%. So it was, uh, 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 you know, if we're looking to China to be the growth engine of the global economy, uh, that is in question. Let's uh, go to the very next day. Uh, after the trade data, we got uh, U.S. CPI. Uh, and it's hard to argue with the CPI. Uh, it is going in the right direction i think the fed is probably happy with the numbers let's get to the table here all items less food and energy point two now you can see the trend over the last few months point two point four point two here we are with another point two uh, we have some negative numbers showing up here commodities uh, less food and energy commodities negative point three new vehicles negative point one uh, used vehicles uh, used cars and trucks negative one point three even the shelter component is staying well behaved, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. So the trend is, is well behaved. Rent of primary residence uh, was uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, now 0 0.4. Uh, still holding there, but well behaved, not increasing. Medical care services, negative 0.4. You have hospital services, negative 0.4. Airline fares, negative 8.1. Look at the look at this negative nine point three negative three negative eight point one negative eight point one. Uh, it's hard to argue with this uh, with this report. 
uh, if we look at it graphically, there's a nice little graph that they put up. They only have up to June. They don't. They haven't added July's data yet. Uh, but look at that. I mean, uh, that went straight up and is coming uh, straight down. It's pretty powerful. And then you can add uh, whatever item that you want. So if we uh, look at uh, new vehicles, uh, that is the darker line here. You can see it uh, coming down. Uh, let's, uh, we don't have, uh, there's used cars and trucks. We're well into uh, deflationary uh, territory on that one. Uh, let's take that one out. Uh, food away from home is starting to turn over. Let's look at shelter. Shelter is starting to turn over. Uh, and I don't know if that's going to continue. I mean, we're, we're looking at mortgage rates that have gone up, but a housing market that just won't quit in terms of where prices are, in terms of where rents are. It doesn't seem to want to give it up. Uh, only, I think, in the last month or so have we seen some some pressures at least in canada we've seen it but it's a very different market uh, so you can play around with this the link is in the description box uh, if we look at uh, the core uh, sticky cpi we've seen this before from the atlanta fed this is uh i have the three charts up here for one month annualized three month and 12 month so if we just look uh, let's just take these two uh, flexible and we'll get rid of these see what kind of picture it paints here so you have sticky cpi which is the orange uh, line and you have flexible cpi which is the brown line we can see flexible as of june uh, was in deflation negative 2.6 sticky sitting at 5.8 but that's 12 month we don't want to look at 12 month you can look at one month annualized and one month annualized uh, is 2.9 percent on sticky CPI, but it's the core that matters more. So let's get the three core measures up and look at where we are. The 12 months should be the highest, right? Core sticky 12 month CPI 5.6%. If we take the last three months and annualize that, it's 3.8%. And if you take the last month and annualize that, it's 2.8%. Uh, and the inflation read that we had for July. Uh, was slightly better than what we had for June. So these numbers uh, are coming down. I seem to think the Fed is probably done. We are actually starting to see some of the lag effects showing up because we, we are seeing more and more effects in the economy. So those lags still need to hit. Uh, I can't believe that there are no lags. Uh, I hear some people say there are no lags. I hear some saying, oh, they are much longer than what they we thought. Uh, they were. Uh, I think it's somewhere between 12, uh, some 10 to 12 months based on, uh, uh, you know, sort of quick back of the envelope calculations that uh, uh, the, the effects really start to hit, not to everyone, but enough that it's going to, that it's going to have its effect. So I, I, I personally think the Fed is done, but I don't think that, that they're in a position to be cutting rates. Uh, and I think that depends on where real rates happen to go. We had some Fed speakers last week, and it seemed the majority of them are on the same page. That uh, job seems to be done in terms of where we are. In fact, one was suggesting, I think it was Williams, was suggesting that we, they may have to cut rates to keep monetary policy tight and not let it get tighter. Uh, and that is uh, a matter of as inflation expectations drop, uh, if you keep the nominal rates the same, real rates start to rise, and that's the more important one. So to keep real rates at a restrictive level, as inflation expectations drop, you'd have to drop the nominal rate to keep real rates at a constant level, otherwise real rates would increase and you'd have tightening or shadow tightening going on, uh, even though you don't have actual policy tightening going on. PPI, uh, rather interesting as well. PPI came in uh, a little bit hotter than expected. Uh, we have to look at PPI in two ways. There are two uh, indexes here. There's final demand and then there's uh, the different stages stage one through stage four. So final demand, just to 
uh, remind you again the difference between CPI and PPI when we're looking at final demand. CPI is what the consumer pays. PPI is what the producer receives. Now, you may think those are the same thing, but the producer only receives the net amount. The consumer pays the gross amount, which includes sales tax. So a rise in sales tax would not affect PPI, but would affect CPI. Um, CPI only measures what the consumer pays for. If the consumer gets something that is not paid for by the consumer, it's not in CPI. So you can think about uh, benefits. Uh, that are paid for by a company but not by the consumer. Certain types of benefits wouldn't be counted in the CPI. Uh, certain types of things that are covered under insurance would not be covered under CPI. So the price of auto insurance would be covered under CPI, but the repairs under insurance would be uh, under PPI. So PPI is what the producer receives regardless of who pays. CPI is what the consumer pays and only what the consumer pays regardless of what they receive. Uh, so final demand is just the other side of the equation. It's the same, we're measuring the same thing, just the other side of it. Uh, total final demand, 0.3. Uh, and we saw CPI was 0.2. Final demand less food, energy, and trade, 0.2. Uh, and do goods and services. So it breaks it up into goods and service. Total for uh, uh, goods, um, 0.1. Foods, 0.5. Take that out. Look at energy, zero. Less uh, food and energy. Uh, that is zero as well. Final demand for services. This is where everything is. Uh, total is 0.3. Trade, 0.7. Transportation, warehousing, 0.5. Other, 0.3. Let's go into, uh, what are we looking for here? Um, the stages, um, which is down here. So uh, these are the inputs to stage one. These are industries that then make or produce something that feed into a stage two company. Uh, stage two makes something that feeds into stage three. Stage three feeds into stage four. Stage four is final demand. These are the ones uh, here that we just saw above for final demand, except this is their input now, not their output. What we saw earlier was the price they're receiving for their output. This is the prices they're paying for their inputs. Total, 0.3. Uh, goods inputs, negative uh, 0.3. So we're in deflation there. Services, 0.8. So their input costs on services, 0.8. That keeps the uh, output uh, price elevated. Stage 3, uh, total, negative 0.6. Goods, negative 1.8. Services, 0.3. Now, it is not always the case that services into uh, stage 3 become an input in services in stage four. That's not always the case. It could be that there's a service at stage three that goes into producing something uh, else altogether uh, that does not feed through to uh, stage four in the sense that it's a part of a value added supply chain. Stage two, uh, services zero, uh, but goods 3.3, .3, total 1.4, and stage one, uh, negative 0.9 on, on goods. So there's lots of evidence here. Goods, negative 0.9, here negative 1.8, here negative 0.3, uh, that uh, deflation is hitting goods. When we look at exports out of China and we're seeing deflation in goods, uh, you could be shipping the same quantity of stuff with deflation, the dollar value would be lower. So in looking at the dollar value of exports out of China, is trade dropping or are prices dropping? It seems more consistent with uh, the price of goods dropping. Uh, we don't know if the quantity of goods are dropping, but measured in uh, US dollars, uh, the total amount is dropping, but it just simply could be that, look here, the drop in the amount of goods being shipped isn't that much, it's that the price is coming down. And given that we've seen China print year over year uh, a deflationary number, that is consistent with, uh, okay, you're measuring exports in dollars. Um, it's quantity times price. How do you know the quantity is, is, is to blame? We already can see that price has something to do with it. So maybe quantity uh, is, is okay. Uh, 
We also have this chart for PPI. You can get all of this, uh, everything so far that I've uh, clicked on for CPI and PPI, the charts, they're right on the same landing page if you're looking for the CPI and PPI report. And then you can play with the different numbers uh, that you want. Again, this is only to June. Uh, the, the black line is the total. You can really see how that has uh, come down. And then you have uh, services and services less uh, trade, uh, transport and warehousing. There's goods, wow, right? Energy, uh, you can see how energy has really come down. So even, we have seen energy prices rebound, uh, but they may be, uh, you know, uh, starting from such a low level. Um, link is in the, uh, in the description box below. Uh, another thing that we had was, uh, uh, once we had the, the CPI, if you were watching uh, the bond market, yields should have gone down uh, because the capital market curve, the further out you go, it starts to reflect uh, expectations of real GDP growth and inflation expectations. And that CPI should have uh, lowered bond yields. And throughout uh, the day, bond yields did uh, go down. What caused it to reverse was the treasury auction. Uh, so on this page here, uh, Treasury Direct, upcoming options, uh, you have upcoming and auction results. Click on the tab for auction results. It starts with bills. Uh, if we scroll down, uh, how come it's not scrolling down for me? Auction results. Uh, there we go. I have to move inside the table to scroll down. I get it now. Uh, scroll down and you get to bonds. There's the 30-year the issue date is uh, August 15th. You have the auction date, and then it's issued uh, a few days later. So it'll be issued uh, August 15th. Uh, you can click on uh, this uh, for the PDF, and you'll get the uh, result for it. Uh, coupon 4 and uh, 1 8. The high yield 4.189. That's what caused uh, some grief, is that the um, it's can, the bid to cover was still very good. 2.4 2. to 1 was still very good. Uh, just the bids weren't that aggressive. What the bidders were saying is that, look, we'll take your debt, but if we, if we do, you got to pay us a lot more to take your debt. Uh, so the high yield was 4.189. So how the auction works, it's not, a, it's not a, a single price that clears the auction. Everybody pays their price. So you submit a bid and the yield that you're willing to take. And the yields are ranked from the lowest to the highest. The lowest yield is the highest price. And you would say, well, I'll take, uh, uh, you know, uh, 500 million at 4.1. And they wanted to clear out uh, 23 billion. Uh, and so what they would do is they would start at the lowest yield and say, you want 500 million, that's fine. And they would start going down the yields or up the yields, 4.1, 4.11, 4.12, 4.13, 4 until they clear the full 23 billion. Or I shouldn't say the 23 billion. In every auction, there are what are called non-competitive bids. And non-competitive bids are bidders saying, look, I'll take uh, whatever... I'll take whatever yield clears the auction. So if there's three billion in non-competitive bids from a twenty billion auction, then they will um, clear twenty billion from the competitive bids, and whatever that price is, that's what the non-competitives. Uh, I think the non-competitives go out of the average of of the price. I'm not quite sure on that, but the high yield was four point one eight nine. You had to get the four point one eight nine to get there. Allotted at the high, 10.5% of the uh, issue uh, went out at 4.189. Uh, the median yield, 4.115. This means that half the bids were above, half were below. The low yield, 4.05. That's the 95 percentile, meaning 5% of the bids actually got below 4.05. Uh, Imagine bidding 4.05, uh, and then it hits the market at almost 4.2. Uh, you've got a loss bang right out of the gate. Uh, and we see the SOMA is still in there for $8.6 billion. Remember, the Fed is running off its balance sheet, but it has a cap. It only runs off so much per month, and when it hits that limit, it reinvests the rest. So the Fed is still uh, in this uh, $8.6 billion. 
Uh, and there is the uh, amount that was uh, auctioned, 23 uh, billion. There is the uh, bids, 55.6. So if you divide these two numbers, you'll get the bid to cover. Uh, and this is uh, what caused the grief is 4.189. Uh, the 30-year is a very particular bond. It has uh, the 10-year is where really a lot of activity happens. Uh, a lot of risk management happens uh, at the 10-year. It is the most liquid tenor. The 30-year is different. Uh, there's a, a heavy clientele effect at the 30-year. Pension funds, life insurance companies specifically. Uh, so there's for for the yield to hit 4.189 for it to miss uh, i guess what the market thought there's somebody missing in in the auction there's a there's some significant clientele that has decided that they're not going to participate in this auction that clientele was more likely than not banks uh banks uh in the last couple of quarters have uh not really shied away from duration per se, but have been favoring liquidity over duration, uh, which means they're probably less likely to step in to the 30-year, uh, more likely to hang out around the uh, 2 to the 5, maybe even to the 10-year, but less likely to step in the 30-year at this point, and they want to favor liquidity because of all of these unrealized losses that their uh, portfolios had. Uh, they probably want to be more asset sensitive and lean more towards the short cent, a short uh, short end of the curve. Asset sensitive in terms of the uh, of t in terms of the uh, speed at which they can change the interest rate on their investments. So my thinking is this is not a rejection of U.S. debt. This is simply a clientele effect uh, where I think uh, the banks were the primary ones missing in this that uh, if they were here, we probably wouldn't have this, this type of auction. But it definitely showed up on the chart. We'll look at TLT uh, as we go through our, uh, our screens. We'll see the big pop-up in, uh, in TLT based on inflation, which is the right thing to happen. And then we'll see the, the huge give back uh, after this. In my opinion, I think this is a buying opportunity uh, on duration because I don't think that this is a rejection of U.S. debt. Uh, because I want you to imagine this for a moment. Uh, there's a problem. Something happened this weekend, Monday morning. Money has to find safety. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Uh, into Chinese bonds? Into Russian bonds? Euro? The pound? Uh, where are you going to go? The, the, the knee-jerk reaction for everyone is rushing in to the safety of the U.S. dollar. It is the largest, most liquid bond market on the planet uh, with no default. Yes, they have dog and pony shows. Yes, they have dog and pony shows, but no default. Uh, you're not going to go into Japan if you're looking for uh, fiscal responsibility. Just look at debt to GDP. Uh, U.S. is still way ahead of Japan in attractiveness on debt to GDP. Uh, so in times of crisis, in times of stress, you're still going to run into uh, the U.S. dollar. There is nothing that has replaced it at this point in time. So this is not a rejection of uh, U.S. debt. This is a clientele effect. This is the 30-year. It's a very particular bond. Same with the 20-year. You can't read anything much into the 20-year. Uh, if you're uh, wondering if there is a, uh, uh, a disillusionment with U.S. debt, look at the more liquid option, auctions. Look at the two-year, the three-year, the five, the ten. And there, were no, there were no real issues there. Uh, the 30 is a very particular uh, bond, way out on the curve, with a lot of duration, with a very high clientele effect. That it had this result tells me there's a client missing. And it's more likely than not the banks that are missing. So this represents an opportunity. The 25-year uh, ended Friday yielding 4.42. Uh, and if it uh, holds there on Monday, I plan to put more money uh, into that. I have uh, no fear uh, holding these bonds. All right, with that behind us, let's have a look at our rates, money market rates, all well-behaved. Um, 
week over week, nothing to see here, uh, pretty flat, all sitting around 5.5%, all the way out to the six month, uh, a little dip on the uh, one year. Uh, capital market rates all increased, and when they increase, we say that is bearish rates up, prices down. Uh, so we'll just write the word bear on that one. The word steepener was being thrown around last week saying we are in a bear steepener. Uh, and a lot of commentary on that about how rare it is, especially at elevated levels. Uh, some pointing out that the bear steepener is the uh, late part of a Fed hiking cycle, that you uh, you sometimes get the bear steepener at the latter part, uh, the latter stages of the hiking cycle, meaning that it is sort of a uh, precursor to rates being cut. I question the steepener part. I don't question the bearish part because I can see that uh, yields have increased. I question the steepener part. Uh, when you're uh, using a curve steepener trade, you need duration, which means you're not using money market uh, um, securities. You're using capital market securities. The most common one is the 2 to the 10, and then there's another trade that's uh, the segment of the curve from the 10 to the 30. So the 2 to the 10, week over week, there's no change. It didn't invert any further, but it didn't steepen. There's no change. So if you put a curve steepener on on the 2 to the 10 last year, sorry, but there's nothing going on there. Uh, you did have a steepening from the 3 month to the 10 year, 11 basis points. However, you can't play that one in terms of a steepener because there's no duration on the 3 month. So how are you going to get duration neutral? Uh, it would be, it would be one really lopsided trade to try to get duration neutral to the point that it's not worth it because you'd have to load up on the three month and have just a small little pinch of salt on the 10 year because it has duration and three month has, well, call it nothing. Yes, it does a little, a tiny, tiny little bit, but call it nothing. So it's not, it's not a steepener trade. You can't play that one. So you're really stuck with the capital market. If you played the 2 to the 10, you got 0. If you played the 10 to the 30, you actually lost on that because it inverted more. So tell me where the steepener is. All right. But last week, uh, we are now in what's called a bear steepener. Even though we're not steepening, we're just going to throw the word out there because, I don't know, lack of headlines, lack of anything else to say. So we may as well just go ahead and say it. Uh, and that it's rare. Uh, so rare, in fact, you can't even see it. <laughs> That's how rare it is. So rare, it's masquerading as a deeper inversion uh, on the knob trade. This is NOB, notes over bonds. And uh, you actually have nothing on TUT. So it is so rare, you really, really got to squint to find it. Bearish, sure. Steepener, I'm not seeing it. Uh, I'm not seeing it yet. And again, I think that the, uh, the effect on the 30-year um, was really a clientele effect. We look at the 10-year and the 2-year. The 2-year increased 11 basis points. The 10-year increased 11 basis points. That's bearish. That's the curve moving up. Uh, but it's not, really, it's not really a steepener. Uh, Soma, unchanged. The Fed uh, did nothing. Nothing ran off. Uh, nothing matured. Uh, balance sheet increased by uh, just a little drop here, 1.5 billion. And money market flows. Money continues to go into the money market, and why not? 5.5%. <clears throat> why not? Uh, retail increased 9.15 billion. Institution 5.22 billion. And on both sides, both government and prime funds increased. September FOMC, 38 days away, probability 90% on the zero. Went from 80 to 87 to 90 over the last uh, three weeks. 13% down to 10% on 25. In three days, we get the minutes from the July FOMC. In two days, we get CPI for Canada. And in four days, we get CPI for Japan. Uh, look what's going on with December. Uh, even though we have, uh, for September, uh, more and more weight on nothing going on, there's still uh, weight going on at for higher rates uh, by the time we get to December because you have September and then two more meetings uh, uh, with one in December. 
look at the 5.5. This is where we are now at the uh, upper end of the range. Last week, 62.1% probability that we would end December there. That has uh, been cut in more than half, 29.9%. Look at the 5.75, meaning that we do have one rate hike before the end of this year, up to 60%. This has dropped to 62. These have basically switched positions and probabilities, and then going up to 6%, uh, here, the weighting is four times greater now, 8.1% versus uh, 2%, and the 5.25, uh, a rate cut. Uh, that is basically going away from 8.9% down to 25 But there is a sentiment shift uh, that we will end the year, the terminal rate will end the year, <clears throat> the weighting on the probability shows at least one more rate hike to go. Um, I'm not in agreement with that yet. Uh, I think September is a pause, uh, and it's hard to tell what's going to happen before the end of the year until you get the data. I think one thing that we've learned over the last year and a half is forecasting out uh, these variables, inflation, uh, is is just guessing. Uh, even the Fed, if you look at the uh, uh, when, when they released their summary of economic projections, uh, they've never gotten it right, ever. Uh, they've been wrong every single time. Uh, that uh, I just, I don't have any faith in any forecast of inflation will come down, then it will reaccelerate in the fall. Almost every projection of inflation uh, has been wrong other than uh, you know, it will move down over time, which it has been moving down over time. But, you know, when we start thinking about the path, uh, uh, having this nonlinear pathway and forecasting that, I, I don't have a lot of faith in that. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It's just from this point where we're standing now, um, other than it being a guess, it's hard to see how you get to that. New York Fed effective federal funds rate 5.33, reverse repo down 20 billion, well under 2 trillion now, now that there's issuance. And if we're looking at lags, 12 month lags, and uh, 12 month, more like weighted average, that there are some rate hikes that hit the economy right away, some that take some time, but if you have a weighting overall, uh, there's a some consensus on the 12-month. Powell seems to think it's 12-month. Um, well, 12 months ago, the effective federal funds rate was 2.33%. Uh, so that is 300 basis points below where we are now. So if we think it works with that kind of lag, that weighted lag, um, you have 225 basis points of hikes that are in the economy, 300 left to go. Real rates, all of them uh, higher from the 5- uh, to the 30-year still have an inversion from the 5 to the 10 of 21 basis points. And Williams uh, was pointing to real rates when he was suggesting that it may be uh, appropriate to cut rates uh, early next year or into next year such that monetary policy does not get too tight. Uh, and the effect he was talking about there uh, was in real rates, that if inflation expectations keep coming down, as we're seeing here, uh, and nominal rates remain elevated, you will get real rates increasing, uh, which means that with through no action of the Fed, monetary policy would still be tightening because of that. So if you have an idea of what restrictive means and you want to maintain that, that level of restriction, uh, as real rates are increasing, you would have to decrease the nominal rate to decrease the real rate back to uh, a restrictive as opposed to overly restrictive territory. So he is keeping his eyes on real rates. Um, Fed funds futures, uh, November, December, uh, 4.41, 4.42, which seems uh, which seems rather odd. There's not much of a change here uh, at all. I mean, one basis point higher here, 2.5 basis points higher. When you look at December probabilities for the terminal rates, uh, a lot of the weighting, 60%, has moved from no change uh, to one more basis point increase. However, that's not showing up in the Fed Funds futures. A slight oddity there. Uh, March, 5.275. Uh, maybe uh, half of a rate cut being priced in, but uh, not as much as the week before. That's 5.5 basis points higher on the implied uh, implied rate. 
And going out to June, 4.95, looking like uh, two rate cuts uh, by June, with 2024 having about six rate cuts, so that two of them by June, with four of them to follow on after. Uh, this is using one month's over. So if we just accept the forward curve, this is what the forward curve is priced is pricing in, uh, whether that happens or not. Let's look at TLT, down 1.2% week over week. SPY down 0.26%. <clears throat> this was uh, Fed speak earlier in the week suggesting that uh, the Fed is done uh, and there probably is no need to continue on. Uh, and then once we got the uh, CPI report later in the week, it came out in the morning, uh, we did have a move up in yields uh, and then a little bit of give back before the 30-year auction and the 30-year auction pretty much uh you know, killed it, uh, but kind of held its elevation uh, uh, into the CPI report. The CPI was positive, and it was the right move. It was the right moves uh, all week based on the data, which is refreshing because 2023, it seems, has been the year of the uh, lowest probability move being the one to expect. That if you look at, well, what could happen? Uh, well, this, 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 but I place almost no probability on this happening. And it seems like, no, that is the very thing that happened. <laughs> you know, that, that it was the long shots that won all year long, the things that you didn't expect to happen. So it's refreshing. It was just refreshing to see that the market was doing the thing that, should, that it should do based on the data. So you look at it, you go, okay, well, that's the right move good enough. I don't have to do anything. It's when it's the wrong move, then you have to think, okay, what am I missing? I'm missing something. There's something I'm missing because that's the wrong move. This was the right move. And even the give back, I thought, well, you got a 30-year auction. As soon as the 30 year is over, we'll get back to business. And it was not good. So you have to start thinking about, well, what's going on in there? Because I'm not seeing this in the any the other auctions. The bid to cover was good. It just the yield was slightly uh elevated. I had more puts assigned to me. Uh, the 101s and the 102s. I have no more 102s. They've all been assigned. I have a handful of 101s left uh, and then some at lower strikes. Uh, more have been assigned to me. They expire next week. I do not I do not see myself rolling them over. I see myself accepting them uh, and holding them. Uh, and what I'm going to do as we push into the end of the year, if I still have them, is I'm going to sell whatever I have and I'm just going to move into the 25-year uh, U.S. Treasury. Uh, as TF TLT continues to drop, this will continue to drop. So it's not as if, well, I'll have less, uh, less to buy. The price of this will drop as well. It will be proportional. So uh, it'll be the same thing. Uh, and uh, whatever unrealized loss I would have on TLT would, would uh, be wrapped up in whatever price I'd pay for the Treasury. But there it's a transaction, right? So I would then have a realized loss going into my tax year end that is actually a real unrealized sitting in the treasury. So it kind of is a nice little tax benefit uh, there to lower my taxes uh, for 2023 for my socialist Canadian government. Uh, and this is my last tax year. Well, not quite. It'll be my last full tax year in Canada. Uh, since I won't be moving out of Canada till I think mid Q1 of 2024, uh, I will have some filing to do for the first part of the year, uh, but that's about it. Uh, but it'd be my last full year of taxes uh, here. And if I can uh, do a small little transaction, sell one security and buy another highly correlated, completely related security, it's still a different security, but it is basically the same thing. I'm just moving out of the ETF and moving into the underlying that the ETF holds instead. Same thing, but I get to realize a loss for tax purposes and be in uh, something that is yielding. If you go into the underlying, you're actually yielding about 110 uh, basis points higher than what TLT will yield for you. Mortgage rates just shy of 7%. Up uh, six basis points. 
uh, Thursday over Thursday, the 10-year was down 11 basis points. The uh, mortgage rate's up 6, so the spread increased by 17, which is not going to be good for mortgage rates, and it wasn't. Annually squeaked out a small gain. But pushing up to 7% on mortgages can't be good for home builders either, and it wasn't. DHI down 2.15, KB Homes down 3.48, uh, and both the ETFs here, Home Builders and Home Construction down 0.75, down 1%. Mortgage apps down 3.1%. Um, with the increase in real rates, here again, this is, this is curious. This is the wrong move. Uh, all the capital market rates, the money market rates went nowhere. Capital market rates all increased and um, REITs increased. IYR up 0.4. PLD and DLR up, uh, up as well. Uh, and those cash flows really uh, need to be discounted at higher costs of capital. Uh, unless you believe that the Fed is going to cut rates um, and that nothing is going to break and we're just going to cut rates, unless you have that belief, which again is the low probability outcome, which just seems to be everybody's rushing for the lowest probability outcome. It's like betting on the long horse. Uh, sorry, the long uh, uh, betting on the long odds for for uh, on every horse race, saying, "Okay, who's got the worst odds? Let me bet on that." Uh, so again, wrong move on this one. It it uh, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. OAS is nothing to see here. Corporate spreads pretty much all well behaved. In fact, Triple uh, C, uh, you know, nine point three three. All you know. That is too much. Let's. Uh, I, I'll take nine point zero three. Let's give me the riskiest debt you got, uh, and I'll be into that. Now I want you to think about that. The spread on triple C uh, decreased, but nobody wants the U. Nobody wants U.S. debt. <laughs> like. There's this aversion to U.S. debt. That's the story last week. Is oh, everyone's afraid of U.S. debt. But triple C, we'll take some of that. Do you see the inconsistency here? This is this is why I, I don't think that the higher yields on U.S. debt is a repudiation of holding U.S. debt. If you're willing, if you're willing to push yields on high yield, let's get a pen that works here, high yield, and especially triple C, if you're willing to push those in the opposite direction, it's something else going on with treasuries, something else. Corporate bond issuance, uh, year over year, up 0.2%. So year to date, almost a trillion dollars of uh, corporate bonds have been issued a year to date. For the uh, month of July, 88.4 billion investment grade, 6.2 in high yield. Uh, the July of 2022, uh, 93.7 in investment grade, so kind of close. 1.8 in high yield, uh, much more in high yield here. And then you had some convertible issuance, no convertible issuance uh, here. In the housing market next week, we get the uh, National uh, Home Builders Index. Uh, it's a diffusion index. It has been an expansion for quite some time. Uh, from a low of 42, it just rocketed straight up. I think the last read was 56. Let's see what happens. Building permits and housing starts. Let's uh, talk about GM and Ford. GM is sitting at uh, 33.89. You can see the uh, chart here. This is the last two weeks. Um, normally under 35, uh, it has been a good strategy the last couple of quarters of buying them uh, in the low 30s and selling them in the higher 30s, uh, low 40s. Uh, at least selling the puts at 35, 34, 33, whenever it got down there, has been a winning trade. Uh, last week, I said that I am not touching uh, this one, not with union negotiations going on. You've got it happening on both sides of the North American border right now. Unifor uh, in Canada and UAW in the U.S., and both of them, both of them are pounding the table uh, and talking tough. Uh, you have a strike vote uh, August, I believe, August 25th. Uh, and this is a vote, uh, this is where membership vote and say, uh, if you can't get a deal, yes, go ahead and strike so that the um, union negotiating team, when they go in that room uh, for September, they can say, we have a strike mandate. 
uh, and it gives them a lot of power because they don't have to then put anything to a vote. If they don't like something, they could just say, that's it. That's the end of that. We're on strike. Um, usually the membership will return a, a strike mandate. You would cripple the union if you didn't. Uh, before negotiations of management knew that the union didn't have a strike mandate, that would that would not work well. So usually a strike mandate is delivered. Uh, and I'm not touching uh, GM this time, nor am I touching Ford. Ford's sitting down around 12, and they've been, you know, these are not high growth stocks, but they've been winning trades in, in, this, in this channel that they've been trading at, but I don't want to touch them. The union is wanting to push from mid-65 or mid-60s uh, all in. That's not take-home pay. That's all in, benefits, everything, uh, pension, um, from mid-60s to 150 an hour which uh, GM has already said that, uh, that, that sim the numbers simply aren't there for that. And Stellantis has already uh, said the same thing, saying that that would threaten our ability uh, to continue to provide employment <clears throat> uh, at the level that we would like to. Uh, so they're basically in a veiled way saying, all you're going to do is eliminate yourself if you do this. You know, you're slitting your own throats. Um, the union is strongly making the case uh, for Mexican investment. Uh, the union is strongly making the case uh, for automation. Uh, so, you know, this is what happened in 2006, 2007, is they got very, very successful in terms of the job categories they had listed. It got to the point where if you needed to do something by uh, reaching over somewhere um, to keep a line going, if that was somebody else's job, you could not just say, well, let me turn that on. It was like, no, we stop the line and we wait for somebody who has that job title to come down here and they're at a different factory. Let's all head to the lunchroom for four hours. Um, I knew somebody in Windsor who uh, worked at Ford at the time. Uh, and he would go, he, he, he was going through four or five novels a week at work. And, uh, you know, well, what are you doing? He says, well, we sit in the lunchroom most of the time because we can't, if there's something on the floor that's a safety concern, we can't pick it up. That's not our job. We have to simply come down to the lunchroom and wait for somebody to go pick it up. You can't even just nudge it over with your foot uh, because the old timer union workers there will start yelling at you because you're ruining their downtime. Uh, unions are, uh, you know, uh, a form of equality where everyone works equally slow. If you work fast on the floor, you will be yelled at. Uh, slow down. Well, so, so the car companies simply can't agree with what the unions uh, are proposing. They've been there before and they know they know the trap that it causes. In 2007, if um, in Windsor, if a factory wanted to uh, lay off workers, it still had to pay 95% of their wage. So what are you going to do? Lay them off to save 5% of the wage? If it, well, we may as well make more cars because it'll at least keep our unit costs low and then we'll have big, huge discounts to clear out the inventory. And that was the strategy that was followed, uh, and that didn't work out well. Uh, I'm not going to place all the blame on the union, but I'd say about uh, more than 50% of the blame uh, for the uh, Detroit 3 having financial difficulties in 2007-2008 against that economic backdrop was the success of the union. They're going to do it again. But you have smarter car companies this time saying, we can't, we can't let the union ever get us in that position again. Uh, you know, there was a uh, sort of a rallying cry, a Marxist rallying cry. Uh, let's get the heavy boot of management off the neck of the oppressed worker. Um, with the strength of unions uh, and the success of unions uh, uh, in 2007-2008, the rallying cry is let's get the heavy boot of the union off the neck of the oppressed management. And here the union is walking in heavy booted again with their knives out. Uh, ready to extort what they want out of management. And I believe a strike is, is, is racketeering. It is criminal. It is a crime against society. Uh, and I think, I think it should be classified as a crime. In 2007, 2008, when the government bailed, bailed out the car companies, they missed an opportunity to strip the union of the right to strike. If you want a healthy union, uh, uh, that's going to have longevity and relevance, you have to strip them of their right to strike because they do this. 
They shut companies down. They ruin lives. Uh, and they don't care. In 2007, 2008, when they were all going to lose their jobs, they pointed out how many jobs rely on every auto assembly worker. Seven jobs for every one of us. Seven jobs. Think of those people. But when they want to strike, fuck those people. It's all about us. A strike is the sacrifice of the many for the benefit of the few. And uh, in this particular round of negotiations, uh, the car companies are not just saying, well, listen, we're going to try to get the best deal we can for our shareholders. They simply cannot give in to the demands that are being asked. And if they do, um, that's the end of it. That's the end of it for the shareholder. And the shareholder may as well leave. So I am not stepping in uh, in front of this, in, in this, this impending train wreck. You've got it both on the Canadian side and the U.S. side at this point in time. Uh, they used to be together in one union, then they split ways, but they've become more friendly uh, over time. Uh, Ford, let's have a look at where Ford is. This is uh, just a two-week chart. Uh, we can uh, you know, move out a bit here, and you can see uh, this pattern that whenever it got to the low 30s, uh, it always found its way back to the low 40s, and always found its way back to the low 30s, and back up again, and back down again, and back up again. It's been a winning trade, and uh, look at them dropping uh, the far end of the chart, uh, you know, they've had those big drops before. When they drop, they drop. They drop quickly, but they also rebound very quickly as well. This could, this could end uh, well. It could, and it could have a nice rebound, but I am not betting on uh, a risk event like that. I'd rather it be over, then I'll step in and, uh, and do something. Um, Ford, let's have a look at Ford on this one here. And there they are. Uh, they were just up around 15, and they have that same kind of pattern that uh, if you had uh, followed a policy of picking them up at $12 or under or selling $12 puts every time they got there, you did quite well. Uh, they're sitting at $12.13, and I have no desire to step in front of this because you still have the strike vote ahead of you, which is happening in about two weeks. That will be a mandate. Uh, so the union's going to talk tough till that point. They're not going to back off. They're going to talk tough to that point. Then they'll go into negotiations with that strike mandate. They'll be in the best position going in there because they will have the rhetoric and they will have the strike mandate with that tough rhetoric. Uh, and so if we're looking for some kind of relief <clears throat> uh, in this, um, it's not going to happen until September. I am not stepping in front of these guys. In currencies, uh, the yen, uh, something to keep our eye on here. <clears throat> uh, hitting up at 145 again, uh, where it uh, peaked last time before it had uh, some kind of excitement uh, based on uh, expectations that the central bank was going to do something more than just relax the yield curve control, but it didn't. Uh, sitting at 145, the last time they stepped in to intervene was over here. Uh, and um, they do have a lot of power to intervene. <clears throat> They're holding a lot of uh, U.S. Treasuries, uh, over a trillion dollars, I think, or in and around a trillion dollars. I think they're the largest single holder of U.S. Treasuries. You don't need much to intervene. Uh, so if they did have to intervene, they would most likely sell their Treasury holdings or some, some part of their Treasury holding. Uh, to get U.S. dollars, to sell U.S. dollars and buy the yen, uh, and then with that buy uh, whatever local domestic bonds they need to buy. They um, <clears throat> have relaxed yield curve control from 0.5 uh, to 1% on the 10-year, uh, but have been, uh, I think they have been uh, buying, uh, even though it hasn't gotten uh, to the uh, to the 1% yet, you get much above 145, you start pushing back uh, to 150. If, they, uh, uh, if the Bank of Japan decides that it doesn't like that, uh, it could be selling U.S. Treasuries, which on top of where we are now uh, could add some yield pressure to U.S. Treasuries. So it is worth watching where the yen goes because I think that more than yield curve control will have an effect on 10-year, on, I uh, shouldn't say 10-year treasuries, but on uh, U.S. Treasury yields. That will have an effect because you're going to need U.S. dollars to sell to buy your currency 
uh, to support it. Let's have a look at the uh, Canadian weakening nicely, uh, which is uh, what I anticipated would happen. Or based on the the data, it should weaken because our GDP uh, for the last month that we saw was negative. We have a much more interest rate sensitive household uh, than the U.S. And the Canadian household has got a significantly higher level of debt uh, per disposable income than the U.S. has. So you have a household with more debt that is more interest rate sensitive. So I believe the Bank of Canada is pretty much done. And we're getting a big report, big risk report on Tuesday, the CPI. And if that comes in... Uh, Consistent with the other reports that show inflation coming down, I think I think the central bank truly is done. Canada will start thinking about cutting rates sooner than the U.S. because of the just the high level of sensitivity of the Canadian household to interest rates. Uh, so they are more likely to start doing that. That should put more pressure on the Canadian. I'm. Uh, <clears throat> primarily just long US dollars right now which serves my benefit because I am leaving Canada and I have to do I do have to move my money into US dollars anyway so it's like well it just so happens to be happening at this time uh, I won't be converting these US dollars back into Canadian so I don't know why I would be uh, you know so eager to watch a Canadian dollar anymore because it's not really going to be my currency of choice uh, but I, I seem to think that uh, 136, 137, uh, this uh, range up here is not unrealistic uh, to see the Canadian dollar get to. Let's have a look at copper down to uh, 371.90. You can see uh, that it uh, made a run for the $4 mark. Let's uh, go in a little bit more. Let's look at uh, daily. Uh, there's $4 there, and uh, that is just... Uh, uh, at the end of July, looked like it was going to uh, continue on, and now we're sitting at uh, 370, 371. For the last couple of times that it did uh, dip uh, down here and down here, I sold 335 puts, uh, and each time uh, for uh, the 335 puts on the December contract, each time it rallied, I was able to cover for a nice gain. Uh, I'd be looking to do the same thing again. Uh, as far as uh, COPEX or Freeport, Freeport's held up uh, quite well considering the pullback from $4 uh, to three seventy dollars is still uh, plus $40. But if I see Freeport pull back to the $40 range or below $40, $39.38, I will get aggressive uh, on that one. If you're following the grains, corn, wheat, and soy, on Friday they all gave back. Uh, the USDA released the August WASDE report. Uh, so uh, page 11 gives us uh, wheat. Let's uh, scroll to page 11. Gives us wheat in terms of where our ending stocks would be. July projection was 592 uh, million bushels, uh, up to 615 million uh, bushels, so greater ending stocks more supply basically uh, if we scroll down corn uh, we have slightly lower uh, 2,262 million bushels down to 2,202 should have been supportive of the price corn did give back not much not much but it did give back a little soy uh, sort of went the other way uh, if we look at where uh, soybean is ending stocks 300 uh, million bushels projected to end now at 245 million bushels uh, so a uh, tighter market in soybeans and soybeans uh, gave up on price as well let's have a look at uh, this week in earnings uh, updated chart it just continues uh, to increase if we look at uh, the positive surprise uh, in terms of the expectations, 7.7% above expectations, uh, and revenues 1.8% above. Um, S&P forward four-quarter operating earnings sitting at 229.13. Uh, here they have it at, where are we, 231.67 based on the closing price on Thursday, 19.3 times forward earnings. Using the S&P operating earnings, uh, we get to 19.5 times forward earnings. 
And this week, uh, as far as who's reporting earnings, it is uh, the big retailers, Walmart and Target. So you have Home Depot on uh, Tuesday, uh, Target on Wednesday with TJX. You have Walmart on Thursday, uh, Ross Stores on Thursday, and Deer on Friday.